We return again to the message of the book of Hebrews. I invite you to turn in your Bibles there. The message of the book of Hebrews, God is speaking through Jesus Christ. Are you paying attention? And that's the message. And so we've seen as the writer begins to develop this message of the importance of listening to Jesus because with this statement that God is speaking through Jesus, there comes some warnings for those who, who won't pay attention. And so he begins by saying, Jesus is better than the prophets and the angels. So be warned, do not drift from what you have heard and by that neglect Salvation. Now, there are some of you here this morning that are neglecting salvation. You know who Jesus is. You know the message, but you refuse to go forward. And, and so the warning says, be careful. Be warned. You can drift right past it into eternity. And then the writer we saw uh, last week goes on to say that, that Jesus is greater than Moses and Joshua. The gospel is greater than the law, and the rest, the promised rest of God, is greater than some physical location over in the Middle East. And because Jesus is greater, be warned, be careful that you do not harden your heart and that you fall short of this rest. This morning, we're going to pick up the third warning that we're going to find in the book of Hebrews, and that is, do not stop maturing. And I want to share with you that this goes to, this goes to a very dark place in this warning. The, the writer is going to say, do not, do not stop maturing, and by that, fall away from Christ. Uh, apostasy. Now, uh, my once saved, always saved folks in here that are, are a little troubled by hearing that there, and so we're going to deal with that, but that's going to be next week, so you want to tune in. This week, we're going to talk about this idea of maturing. What does it mean to be maturing and the problem that that presents for us when we are not clearly engaged in growing in our understanding, our faith, and our practice with Christ. It's kind of like the husband who was worried about his wife's hearing, and he just was convinced she had gone stone cold deaf. And so he walks in a room, and he sees her over in the, in the far corner, and he stands up on the other side of the room and says, honey, can you hear me? And she continues unaware of his presence. See, he walks halfway across the room, and he goes, honey, can you hear me? And she just continues again. And so he gets right up behind her, and he says, honey, can you hear me? And she wheels around and says, for the third time, yes, what do you want? This morning, as we talk about hearing and paying attention, don't be worried about the person over in the corner. Test your own hearing. Because that is the problem of maturity, as we're going to see in Hebrews this morning. Turn with me there in your Bibles, Hebrews chapter 5. <clears throat> uh, any, anybody who's ever tried to teach a lesson, preach, has ever tried to instruct anybody is going to get what, what the writer is saying here. Listen, we have a great deal to say about this, but it's difficult to explain since you have become too lazy to understand. Literally, it says you've become dull in hearing. You're, you're not paying attention intently to what is being said. You have become too lazy to understand. Although by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the basic principles of God's revelation again. You need milk and not solid food. Now, everyone who lives on milk is inexperienced with the message about righteousness because he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature, for those whose senses have been trained to distinguish between good and evil. Would you bow with me? 
Lord, the prayer is very simple this morning. Help us to hear your word. Clean the worldly wax out of our ear canals so that the truth of your word can be communicated clearly in such a way that it strikes our ear and is imprinted upon our minds and our hearts in such a way that we grow up to the full stature of Christ. We grow up into maturity, needing solid food and not just spiritual junk food. Speak to us today through your word. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, as we look at our text here, uh, the statement that is going to be made is that Jesus is better than Aaron. Jesus is better than Aaron. So let me just again remind you how communication works. That's what's known as an assertion. That is a statement about reality. That is a statement that says, here's, here's, here's how I see it. And assertions need support. They need arguments. And so the writer is going to make this statement that Jesus is better than Aaron, and then he's going to tell you why he is better. And so in this passage, again, as we're preparing this idea of maturity, uh, he's going to give us three quick pictures of why it is that Jesus is better than Aaron. Aaron being the, the first high priest there with Moses, there in the wilderness, there in the tabernacle, offering the sacrificial system so that, what? So that he could be our God and we could be his people, that he could be there in the midst of his people. How does a holy, righteous God dwell with sinful, fallen, evil man? There has to be a mediation that is happening here. And in the old system, it was through the high priestly sacrificial system of which Aaron is the first. And the writer says, so that was the old way, and now we have Jesus as our new high priest. We've got to go all the way back to the end of chapter 4 to pick up this thought. And so looking there in verse 14, it says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. So here again, he says, what do you believe about Jesus? Hang on to that. Continue. Know what you believe and have a firm grasp on what you believe and continue to hold on to keep the faith, your confession about Jesus. Let us hold fast to our confession, verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but, but one who has been tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. So here's point number one about Jesus being greater than Aaron. And that is Jesus is our uniquely sympathetic high priest. That as Jesus serves in his mediation between sinful man and holy God, he is able to do that in a uniquely sympathetic way. Look down in chapter 5, as the writer explains this, says, for every high priest taken from among men is appointed in manners pertaining to God for the people to offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. So what's he saying? That the problem is sin, and Jesus is better at it because he was able to deal with sin and overcome sin. But Aaron was just a man. He still had to deal with sin, and it goes on here. It says uh, that he is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray since he is also clothed with weakness. What was the problem with Aaron as a high priest? He was just a man. He was a sinful man. He had the same problems that he was dealing with for the people. And since because of this, he, Aaron, must make an offering for his own sins as well as for the people. Here's the problem with earthly high priests. They are imperfect. They are sinful. They deal gently 
with those who are sinful. See, that's, that's our problem, isn't it, when it comes to sin? If you've ever had to preach, you ever, ever had to teach, you ever been in any kind of leadership role, you, you quickly realize the problem with this is that you really are no better than the people you're leading. You're just in a different position. You're no less sinful than they are. But you have to be the one. And so the human nature in us goes one of two ways. We either are too lenient. Hey, how, how can I judge them when, when I'm guilty of the same? Or we're hypocritical. I'm going to judge you and don't look at my sin. And that's the problem with the earthly high priest. But you see, Jesus, Jesus was tempted, as he says, but he was without sin. He overcame sin. That's why we like, that's why we like preachers. That's why we like teachers. That's, like, that's why we like to put people on pedestals. Why? Because, hey, uh, there, there's a whole different set of rules for them. But when it comes to Jesus, it says, no, I, I've been there. I, I faced what you faced. And don't bring, that, don't bring that weak sauce that it was too hard for you. Hey, I, I went through it. I faced it. And yeah, it was without sin. It's a greater high priest. Uniquely sympathetic. He knows what it is, but uniquely in the sense of saying not only, I can be sympathetic, but I'm also victorious. I overcame sin. Secondly, it says that not only is he uniquely sympathetic, but look at verse 16. Therefore... Let us approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace in time of need. Not only is he uniquely sympathetic, he is also exceptionally helpful. This is the kind of high priest that we need. He sits on the throne of grace. We, he has allowed us to come, even though we are maybe too lenient or we are hypocritical. He says, I want you to come. I'm, we're going to deal with your sin. Come boldly that you might find grace and mercy in your time of need. It's about knowing where to go to find help and to get help. Going on then, we see thirdly that Jesus is better than Aaron because he is perfectly qualified to be our high priest. We pick that up over there in, uh, in verse 4. It says, no one takes this honor on himself. Instead, a person is called by God, just as Aaron was. In the same way, Christ did not exalt himself to become a high priest, but God who said to him, you are my son today, I have become your father, also says in another place, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. And so he was called by God. He was given this role as high priest. And then he also qualified himself. Look in verse 7. During his earthly life, he offered prayers and appeals with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. This is key here, verse 8. Although he was the son, capital S there, although he was the son, Jesus learned obedience from what he suffered. And after he was perfected, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him and was declared by God a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. But there's a whole lot I want to say about this, but it's difficult to explain because you are too lazy to understand. That was from the Word of God, by the way, what I just said there. I went to a church, and uh, one of the jokes was that uh, every pastor interview, there was a question of, who is Melchizedek? How many of y'all can answer that question? Well, see, that's, that's the problem. That, that's what the writer of Hebrews is saying here. He says, I'm going to talk about Melchizedek, but I, I, I see your faces have glossed over. I, I, I see your ears have shut down. I see you have lost all energy in this message as I'm teaching this here. We're going to talk about Melchizedek? What's that got to do? Well, uh, after we deal with this warning here, we're going to take about four chapters and talk about Melchizedek. 
and the importance of Melchizedek. But the problem is, you're too lazy, he says. You, you don't want to hear this. You don't want to deal with this. Why? Because you're a bunch of babies. That's from the Bible, by the way. That's not me. I, that's not the sermon, okay? But it's also the point, isn't it? He says, you are spiritually immature. I have to dumb it down because you want to play dumb. You really don't want to grow up. You really don't want to mature. You really don't want to advance. Because by this time, you ought to be teachers, he says. But no, we got to go back to kindergarten. It is the challenge for us, the warning, again, is to say, you better grow up in your faith or you're going to fall away in the days to come. You better know what you believe and be able to hold on to that because the world is coming for you with all that it has to tear you away from your relationship with Christ. Are you prepared to listen? Are you ready to listen? And he's going to, he's going to put the problem this morning uh, in, in three, different, uh, three different pictures. He's going to, he's going to say, this is, a, uh, this is an educational problem. There's a problem in your education. This is a nutritional problem. There, there, there's a problem in your diet. And this is a developmental problem issue. You are not maturing and progressing as you ought. And so let's look at that this morning as, as we kind of really get now into, into the message. Jesus is greater than Aaron. Aaron was a high priest. Jesus is the perfect high priest. But you're not going to understand why that matters and how that applies if you are not growing and maturing and developing. And so the first time you get out here and you're asked, how do you know this? How can you trust this? You're going to fall away from your faith and you're going to just go along with what the world tells you and what they're saying because you are not mature in your faith. So uh, beware the signs of spiritual immaturity. That's what we're going to kind of, kind of try to flesh out here in these next few moments. Said so first of all, it's an educational Problem. Look in verse 11. It says, we have a great deal to say about this, and it's difficult to explain since you have become too lazy to understand. You're, you're not putting in the effort. You're not putting in the work. You're not putting in the time. You're not giving yourself the opportunity to grow and understand and to learn this stuff. And, and he uses the word uh, lazy, dull. We could translate that word also boring. I'm bored. Just not in the mood. Oh, I, you know, there's some of this stuff I get excited about. You know, I thought heaven, you know, uh, hell. That kind of interests me too because I don't want to go there. I like scaring the hell out of people. You know, that's kind of fun. But the rest of this is kind of boring. In fact, you're just suddenly interested. I use the word hell, right? But all around you are people going to hell, and you couldn't care less. See, we, we're bored. This isn't interesting. It doesn't stimulate me. And so the writer says it's, it's an instructional problem. Too lazy to understand. Because by this time, you ought to be teachers. But you need someone to teach you the basic principles of God's revelation again. By this time, how does that apply to you? By this time, you ought to be what in Christ? If we just look at the calendar, we, 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 we look at, at how many times we've gone around the sun, how many it's been, by this time, you ought to be what? Does this apply to you? Now, again, if, if you're a new believer in faith, understand there's no condemnation here. And if you are immature, again, there's no condemnation. The only condemnation comes is if you continue and you persist and you demonstrate how committed you are to being dull of hearing. It, it would be like you send your kid to college 
and you spend all that money and you've put it on your calendar. This is the day they graduate and you show up for graduation services and you look for your kid and, and, and you can't find them. They're not down there. And you look for their name and it's not in there. And, and you find them later on somewhere, somewhere on, on the campus and you're like, what happened? Well, I'm not going to graduate. Well, well what, what, what do you still need to do? Not only am I not going to graduate, I flunked out. Not only did I flunk out, I got to go all the way back to kindergarten to start building my qualifications. That's the picture that he's writing here. It says, when it comes to Christ, by this time, you ought to be the teacher. You ought to be the preacher. You ought to be the instructor. You ought to be the facilitator. But we're still learning the words that Jesus loves me. Here's the sign of spiritual immaturity as it comes to education. It's an attitude of unwillingness to engage in difficult topics. We find them boring. We find them tedious. We find them superfluous. Look it up. We struggle, and yet we wonder why the world is not convinced by our faith. Notice how Jesus learned. Back in verse 8, I pointed out earlier, did you catch that? Although he was the son, he learned obedience from what he, what? Suffered. Isn't that the real reason? It isn't, isn't that the, the true motivation why it is we want to stay babies, we want to stay immature, we want to stay back here? We don't want anybody expecting anything from us because if they do, if expectations get raised, there is the problem of us meeting those expectations. And sometimes they are hard, sometimes they are difficult, but always there is an element of suffering that comes with our development in maturity. By this time, you ought. It's not a question of long-term existence. It's not a question of growing intelligence. It's always a question of obedience. This instruction, this education is learning through our suffering. Let me just break it down this way. What does it do? God allows your comfort to be destroyed. That's why life is hard. He allows your comfort to be destroyed so that you will look for a way to build it back by the truth of God. Go back again. That high priest, the kind of high priest we need, what is he? Hey, he's there. That we can come to him in our time of need and find grace and receive mercy. It's knowing that he is our comfort. And over and over again, the Lord has to let us go through these teaching moments where we have to learn through suffering how it is to be obedient. Let me, very quickly, let me teach you how to teach yourself anything, all right? If you will, if you will write this down, you will be able to instruct yourself about anything. The three elements to learn anything are vocabulary, grammar, and rhetoric. Vocabulary. Everything has a definition. In fact, in the world in which we live, we often find we're using the same vocabulary, not the same dictionary. Gay marriage doesn't exist if we define it properly, because it's not gay marriage, it is marriage. And if we define marriage according to the Word of God, we find that marriage is defined as a relationship between what? A man and a woman. Now, wait a minute. We have to redefine those terms, right? And so as we begin to see that we live in a world that is wanting to use the vocabulary and confuse us with the vocabulary because they have changed the definitions. 
And so it's imperative for us, again, to make sure that we understand the vocabulary. So we need to know the words and terms we're using. Secondly, there is the grammar. The grammar is the way we put these definitions and these words together to have meaning. And so we begin to have nouns and verbs and modifiers so that we are able to communicate something, whether it's uh, an assertion, hey, I believe this, or an argument, I believe this because. And then there is rhetoric. Rhetoric is the sense in which we, we take our vocabulary and we take our grammar and we now use that in a way to instruct and motivate and help people discover and know and live lives that truly do glorify the Lord. Now, why does this matter? Because one of the things rhetorically you don't want to do is mix metaphors. What's a mixed metaphor? Well, you can wait till the cows turn blue. That's a mixed metaphor. Wait, cows turn blue, what does that mean? or the cows come home or turn blue in the face, right? And so I've mixed a metaphor. Well, a moment ago when I was reading, the writer of Hebrews introduced what appears to be a mixed metaphor. Go back to chapter 4, catch it again, see if you can figure it out where it is you were supposed to go, wait, what, what? If you were really listening, if you were paying attention, it should have caught your ear as you said, wait a minute, I'm not sure that, that that's that I understand what, what that just said here. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us approach the throne... I, we were talking about a high priest, right? High priests don't sit on thrones. In the Jewish system, a high priest could not be the king, and a king could not be a high priest. But here we have this writer of Hebrews kind of saying, wait a minute, uh, we're talking about Jesus as our great high priest who's sitting on a throne. Is this a mixed, mixed metaphor, or is he communicating something? Skip down over into chapter 5, verse 6. It says, also says in another place, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. We're going to go into Melchizedek. I got several chapters to flesh that out, but let me just give you the short answer. The order of Melchizedek is Melchizedek was priest and king. It's a different priesthood. It's not the Aaron priesthood. It is the priesthood of Melchizedek. And it is Jesus as our high priest who is also our king. Well, we have more to say about that. Um, secondly, signs of spiritual immaturity. There's the nutritional problem. Um, milk instead of solid food. Here is a sign of, of a failure to demonstrate any spiritual progress. Your need for milk instead of solid food, signals a problem in your development. What if at our next church-wide fellowship, we're like, hey, and we're just going to put bottles of milk out for everybody? Wait a minute, isn't that kind of what the ice cream fellowship is, isn't it? Okay, so all your babies show up, right? Uh, we're going to have frozen milk. But we understand that if we're just having milk, that's what we give babies. We, we, we get that because it's easy to take in and it, it gives them all that they need and, and, and helps to bulk them up. But there comes a point in here where their diet needs to extend to something more than just junk food or just milk. And spiritually speaking, it's where we've got to get more than just the, what we would call the milk uh, of the gospel. Now, we're going to say more about this in, the, in, in next week as he begins to talk about this idea of milk and solid food, you'll look down in, in verse, uh, verse um, 
1 says, Therefore, let us leave the elementary teachings about Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works, faith in God, teaching about ritual washings, laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And so that is not to say that those things are milk and everything else is meat. What he is saying is there is a level of understanding that is like milk. There is a surface. There is a very simplistic view. But there is a depth to these. There is a, there is a wealth of knowledge and understanding that you need to have. Because you need to know this, that you are in a spiritual world and you have a spiritual enemy known as the devil. And the devil is a schemer out to destroy your faith. Again, back as we are looking at this problem, verse, uh, verse 13, now everyone who lives on milk is inexperienced with the message about righteousness because he is an infant. There is this sense in which we do not want to flesh out what righteousness is. Righteousness means right in my own eyes, right? Isn't that, isn't that what it means? When I get on Facebook, hey, that makes me mad, and so I'm going to tell you what's the truth. Or, or I get out here and I hear something that I don't agree with, or uh, right in my own eyes. Isn't that what righteousness is? No, righteousness is being right in the right way. Righteousness is being right according to the Word of God. And it shows a lack of experience when we've not spent the time in the Word to understand and to flesh out what God means by righteousness. Satan is a schemer and he is out to destroy you and he will, he will prey on the immature. He, he offers candy to, to children to lead them astray. If you could sneak into Satan's office and you could go through his file, you would find, I believe, in his files, a file with your name on it. And if you open that file and you began to read it, you would be able to see that he has documented every spiritual strategy that you fall for. He knows where you are inexperienced. He knows how easy it is. Oh, hey, they are really insecure. Hmm, I can exploit that. I'm, I'm going to find every way to, to, to make them feel like that they've got, to, they've got to put it on Facebook or they've got to put it on Instagram and they've got to puff themselves up or they've got to, they've got to do certain things. They're going, to, they're going to mortgage everything they have so that everybody will think they're something. Oh, they're given to, they're, they're given to discouragement. Ah, man, I know how to play with that one. I'm going to find every critical person I can find. I bring them along beside them and, and have them just give, every, give opinions and, and views. and just, I'm just going to frustrate the fire out of them to the point that they just be on and on. Satan is a schemer. But how important is it is for us to, to spend that time making sure we're listening to the Word, saying, Lord, where is my security? It's, it's not in what people think about me. It's in what you think about me. Where is my encouragement? It, it's not in how successful I am. It is in the victory that I find and the rest that I find in you. I need to move on. What is the third one? The third struggle here of immaturity, a developmental problem. Notice verse 10, or in verse 14. The writer says, but solid food is for the mature, for those whose senses have been trained to distinguish between good and evil. Here is this, this sense of development, the sense in which we, uh, 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 we show a lack of real world experience applying scriptural truth. When we, when we don't take the script, the, uh, I, I'm, I'm not saying it's that good, but I'm saying it's biblical what I'm sharing with you today. Are you going to do anything with it? I mean, I, I don't even know if this will last to the invitation. Can we even get out of the building carrying something? Do, do, do we ever take it any further? Sunday school lessons this morning, did, did you, can you even remember what it was? And that's, that's what the writer says is, is, is oh, we act like we're learning all this, but if we never put it into practice, if we never use it, what have we really taught ourselves except how to fake it, 
how to pretend, how to pass as a mature spiritual adult when really we're just an infant. I want to close with, uh, with just this observation about developing our spiritual senses to promote our Christian maturity. And so let me just, just let's just work this very quickly. What are senses? When we talk about the senses, uh, the senses are the way our brain receives information so that it can perceive a physical world, right? We have five senses. There's, there's touch and there's taste. There is smell. There is sight and there is hearing. And, and with these five senses, we are able to make relationships, we're able to, to think thoughts, we're able to make decisions and go places, uh, see things, do things. These senses are the way in which we operate in this world. If one of those is diminished, we are diminished in our ability to perceive. I, I'm just going to carry it over and just say that, that the physical senses mirror the spiritual senses. In fact, that's what we are actually seeing in the book of Hebrews, is he is warning us about the fact that we are not using our spiritual senses as we ought to. Sense of touch versus don't harden your heart. There's a, there's a loss of sensitivity. We're not getting the information through what we are feeling. Uh, earlier, that sense of hearing not just hearing through our ears, but hearing with that, with that kind of spiritual insight that says, this isn't just a guy up there talking, it's coming from the Word of God. There's the Spirit of God that's at work in this. Next week, we'll talk about spiritual taste. It says that those that have tasted the truth of God and they fall away, it's impossible for them to come back. Spiritual sight or insight, that sense of smell whereby we are able to distinguish what is going on. And so it's important for us to be learning and using those spiritual senses to develop and mature. And maturing isn't something that we have to wait someday to do. In fact, we do it every day. I'll just finish with this story here. It came to me as praying about the sermon and uh, uh, our, uh, our first child had the passy. Anybody got the passy? You know, had the pacifier there. And, you know, when, when they're little bitty, it's great. But Shelby did not want to give up the passy. She wanted to keep the pacifier. And, and everywhere she'd go, she'd, you know, you know sucking on that pacifier. And Though we would try to reason and try to, try to take it away, we just, you know, couldn't happen. And so finally, uh, Laurie just took a little pair of scissors and said, fine, you can have your pacifier. But she took and she cut the very end off of that pacifier so that that little air bubble that's on the inside was gone and it was just flat. And, and so came bedtime and Shelby gets in the bed and, and she's like, can I have my passy? And so, yeah, here's your passy. And she gets her passy and it's like, it don't work no more. Well, I'm sorry. And, and the tears begin to flow, and there's the struggle. What am I going to do? I don't have my passy. How can I sleep without my passy? Well, uh, I give my wife credit for this. Uh, she was teaching our children scripture from day one. And we had, uh, we, we had these uh, scripture songs that, uh, that we would play for our kids. And one of them is the uh, Steve Green, uh, and it's the, uh, when I am afraid I will trust in you. And they would go around singing it. And so there's Shelby in her bed and she's crying. And we're like, now what do we do? We've ruined the passy, you know? We're, we're ready to go buy a new one and give it back, you know? And then suddenly it gets quiet. And there through the sobs and in the darkness, mom and dad listening on the little baby monitor, we suddenly hear through the suffering, through the struggle, we hear this little infant voice begin to mature. Realizing the past he was not gonna give the comfort, had to find comfort somewhere else. Where do I go for comfort? 
in the way that only an infant child can take you from the milk to the meat. She began to sing. When I am afraid, I will trust in you. I will trust in you. I will trust in you. When I am afraid, I will trust in you. In God, whose word I praise. I can tell you, Daddy, Daddy never suffers without remembering that first and remembering that lesson and the need to have the maturity in those moments when life is not going the way I want it to go. As my comfort is being destroyed, remembering where my comfort really is that I can come boldly, boldly to the throne, to the throne of grace. And I can find grace and receive mercy in my time of need. We have to grow up or we will fall away. Be warned, do not stop maturing. Heavenly Father, I just pray in these moments <clears throat> as you would speak to our hearts today that we would, with open ears, sensitive hearts, attuned sense of smell, that, Lord, we would have the eyes of our spirit opened as we would come before you to receive your instruction your direction that we would not just be inexperienced but that we would get into the the, the word gymnasio the word for exercise we would get into the spiritual gym and begin to build our faith our confession that we can hold on to. Come, Lord Jesus, speak to us here in this time and in this place. In your name we pray. Amen. The invitation is going to be a little different this morning. Take your bulletin. Got the little tear off in there. See, our biggest problem is, is we don't want to get in the game. And some of you know what to do. And so on that tear off street, I want you to just write, I know what I need to do and I'm going to do it. I'm going to be obedient. Okay. Some of you would say, might want to say, I don't know what to do. Give me an assignment. I don't know what to do. Give me an assignment. Because by this time, you ought to be teachers, right? By this time, you ought to be able to do something. And, and again, there's no condemnation if you don't know what to do. The condemnation is not admitting it and moving forward. And so if you're here this morning and you're like, I'm ready, I'm ready to take at least one step of maturity. Give me an assignment, Brother Mike. Give me an assignment, Central Baptist Church. And if you're open to that, if you're ready to, to, to learn obedience, write that down. But I just encourage you as the offering plate is passed here in a moment. And now, put your name on it. If you ask for an assignment, don't just say, give me an assignment. Uh, I guess God can reach you wherever you are. But I just want to take a few moments as the, as the praise team is, is singing. Just get your, get your slip of paper out there, right on there. I know what to do and I'm going to do it. Or I, I'm not sure what to do. Give me an assignment. And let's make a difference this week. Let's, let's grow up a little bit this week. Let's do this in Christ's name. As they sing, you write. If you're needing to step out and make a response, you come.